All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening. No? All right. <laughs> My name is Dr. Alicia Johnson. I am the director of the Women's Center here on campus. And this is Eliza Farrell. She's the program assistant over in the Women's Center. We have Micah, who's one of our interns this semester, over there. Um, and so tonight, obviously, you're here for the Global Google Hangout with um, some female Paralympians and a deaf Olympian. Um, and so I first wanted to start by recognizing our co-sponsors. So we have the Department of Kinesiology, Human Kinetics, and uh, Health Education. Uh, we also have the Department of Special and Early Childhood Education, the Women's Advocacy Council, which is a student organization, as well as the United Women of Oshkosh. Um, so thanks for everyone for being here, and thanks to Chris Stratton and Dr. Liz Cannon for bringing their classes. Um, so I hear Dr. Cannon's making her class write a two-page paper, so maybe Chris's class should also write a two-page paper. <laughs> I thought it was only one page. Um, okay, so tonight um, we have three of our five uh, panelists that were scheduled, Leticia Martinez and Kelsey Lefebvre. Um, I thought she could not join us, but they are at the White House um, getting recognized for their competition in the Rio Paralympics. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited for us to be here with our three panelists, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, to introduce themselves. So maybe let's start with Dr. Andrea Woodson-Smith. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Woodson-Smith. I'm an associate professor at North Carolina Central University. I'm also a USA Paralympian for wheelchair basketball. <laughs> Sorry, and you want to go next? Sure. My name is Ann Cody, and I'm a three-time Paralympian in the sport of wheelchair basketball in 1984, and the sport of wheelchair racing, which is track and field, in the 88 and 92 games. Kate, we can't hear you. Kate, we saw the mute button pop up for a second. Okay, while well we uh, maybe wait on Kate, and do you want to, did you talk, talk about your work at the State Department at all? No, I didn't. I'd be happy to. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm a program officer in the Sports Diplomacy Division at the U.S. Department of State, and we run a variety of sports diplomacy programs. We really use sport as a tool for our um, embassies overseas to interact with uh, the citizens of the countries that they're based in and to share um, American values and ideas and um, and uh, w you know with people of the people of the world and um, sport is a fantastic vehicle as all of you know for convening people for um, really bringing people together who may not share a common language um, I'm responsible for our Empowering Women and Girls Through Sports Initiative, 
which includes a global sports mentoring program, which is a phenomenal program that brings emerging leaders to the U.S. for a month-long mentorship. How much, how much more do you want me to share at this point, Dr. Johnson? Uh, yeah, that's a new title change since we last talked, huh? <laughs> um, so, Dr. Woodson-Smith, maybe do you want to briefly share about your sports envoy experience? Sure. Um, I actually was sent to China, Guangzhou, China, uh, as a sports envoy to talk about different opportunities for girls and women in sports with disabilities in sports um, and to talk to different organizations, the um, higher power over there uh, to talk about the involvement and the inclusion. Um, and I spoke with also with professors over there as well to talk about how to include females with disabilities into physical education, physical activity, and sport as well. Um, I've also gone to Papua New Guinea to talk with girls about their involvement in sport um, and as well as uh, being a victim of violence. Uh, so those two opportunities were from the Department of State uh, to be sent out to, to talk about those particular areas for inclusion in sport. Thank you. Kate, do you want to try again? Kate, we're out of ideas of how to get your mic turned on. Okay, so we said, or someone said to maybe check your internal microphone. Go into settings and then your internal mic. All right, so while we still work on Kate's microphone, sorry, Kate. Um, one of the classes here at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh created some questions, which the panelists have all received. So let's start with the first one. Um, growing up, were you able to participate in all of the sports that you wanted to? So Anne or Andrea can go. Andrea, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, growing up, I was pretty much able to participate in all sports. Um, typically at the early ages of sports or early ages of my life, I was one of two females who participated in basketball. Um, I was one of two females who participated in t-ball. Um, and then when, it, when I got into the um, components where the boys were participating in sports and the girls were participating in sports, I was always able to do so. Um, the only difficulty that I truly had was as I became into a collegiate athlete, uh, going to the gym for extra time to, to participate in, in basketball, whether it was pickup games or anything like that. Again, it was a little challenging to get ch selected to participate on a team. Um, other than that, I was able to participate. It was just that I was going to be the only female on the, on the basketball court at that time. Um, and then once I got into wheelchair sports, it was a little bit different, but I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But in my early, early years, um, it was just one or two of us on the basketball court, and then later on I was able to participate pretty well. So do you want me to talk next? Sure. Great. Great. Wasn't sure how Kate was doing. I grew up in a rural area in upstate New York, and I was one of the first beneficiaries of Title IX. So as I was um, coming up through grade school into junior high, we had um, girls' competitive sports programs, after-school programs available to us, which was fantastic because I was very active young person and loves sports and recreation, so wanted to be very active in anything and everything. Um, and then, of course, um, by the time I got to high school, I was competing on a, a girls' varsity sports, um, such as field hockey, volleyball, basketball, and softball. My junior year in high school, 
I acquired my disability. I'm a paraplegic. And my athlete identity was really, really strong. And so I was looking for opportunities to continue to develop as a, as a competitive athlete and pursue my goals and dreams which were to compete at the college level. Okay, great. Kate, do you want to try again? Does it work now? Yes, yay! <laughs> <laughs> We're all very happy. Okay, so maybe if you want to introduce yourself, um, also talk about your role as a youth rep, and then um, answer that first question about growing up. Okay, so um, I am a two-time deaf Olympian, and I'm on the U.S. deaf women's national soccer team. So um, I've been on that team since I was 15, and in 2014, um, I was given the opportunity to be a youth representative on the USA Deaf Soccer Board. And USA Deaf Soccer is a nonprofit organization. So basically that means that we have to do all our fundraising and pay for everything out of pocket. So it's kind of been an uphill battle, um, but I really enjoyed it. And it's given me an opportunity to do things like this and to connect with people across the nation. Um, as far as growing up, I have a cochlear implant. I got one when I was six years old and um, it's really enabled me to adapt well to the hearing world. And I didn't really have any problems growing up as far as playing sports and stuff. I was very athletic. I loved playing everything. I was very shy though and being hard of hearing didn't help. Um, I tended to avoid swimming just because my cochlear implant is not waterproof and I did want to swim competitively, um, just like in a neighborhood sports team, but um, I just want to be able to hear, and for me, that impeded me from doing that, even though accommodations could have been made. But yeah, I was pretty lucky with how I was able to do everything. Okay, great. And you were, you're, are you still a collegiate athlete, or have you graduated? I just graduated in May, so I'm technically retired from college sports now. Congratulations. Hopefully the students in here will also reach that graduation stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so how did you get involved with the Paralympics or the Deaf Olympics? Andrea? <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I got involved in the Paralympics um, through my local wheelchair basketball team. I was in Texas at Texas Women's University working on my doctorate in adaptive physical education and I uh, was taking a disability sport course. And one of the things that, our prof that my professor allowed us to do was to interview or have guest speakers into the class or we would go out to where the guest speaker was located. And so we went to Dallas to interview one of the women for, on the women's team who just happened to be a former Paralympian for wheelchair basketball. And so they allowed us to try out the sport, uh, get into the wheelchairs and practice a little bit. And uh, my professor um, let one of the athletes know that I had uh, arthritis in my hips and that that, was, that made me eligible to play wheelchair basketball. And since I had a, a basketball background, a collegiate basketball background, uh, they recruited me to play wheelchair basketball with their team and once they knew that I had the skill of basketball I just needed to get acquainted with the chair uh, they sent me to a wheelchair basketball camp and at that wheelchair basketball camp there were several uh, USA wheelchair basketball coaches um, and so they at the time stated that eventually more than likely I would probably make a USA wheelchair basketball team um, and so in 2003 I tried out for the Paralympic team uh, the Parapan team, actually, um, and I didn't make it. I was actually an alternate, and um, in 2004, um, no, actually, it was in 2003, one of the girls on the team uh, became sick. Uh, she was diagnosed with, a, with an illness, and so she was removed from the team, and so since I was an alternate, I took her place, and so that put me on the 2004 team um, for my first year as a Paralympian, and so I've been uh, involved in Paralympic sports for uh, about six or seven years now, on and off. And I found out about 
the Paralympic movement when I was in rehabilitation, when I was um, learning how to use a wheelchair and move around um, independently, because I was so interested in sport, um, um, the nurses told me about the Paralympics and about the athletes they knew who competed. So that was really helpful because I had no idea that competitive sports opportunities, and particularly at the Paralympic level, even existed. Um, when I was looking for colleges and universities to attend, um, I wanted one that had a collegiate sports program. And at, at that time, there was only one um, college in the country that, that had a women's collegiate sports program, wheelchair sports program. And that was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I enrolled and um, got a bachelor's degree and then eventually a master's degree from there. And that's where I started working with um, coaches and, and training with other athletes who were Paralympians. Um, and that really got me into that um, pathway to developing into an elite athlete. Um, I got involved with the Deaf National Team. Actually, when I was 12, one of the scouts was at um, State Cup in Georgia, which is where I'm from. and. He approached my coach after the game because he saw that a cochlear implant and he asked if I was interested and at the time I was kind of like why would I join this team I'm not deaf because technically when you think of deaf people you think of people who sign and don't wear hearing devices at all and um, so I waited until I was 15 and then I went to a camp and um, two months later we were going to Taiwan for the first deaf Olympics. Awesome. So you all have competed all over the world and in several different Paralympics and Deaf Olympics. What is your favorite memory from the games? I would say for me, um, my experience might be a little bit different than theirs. In 2004, I was removed from the Paralympic team because I couldn't get medically cleared. And um, at that time, my team knew how devastated I was when that happened. And after they came back to the U.S., they actually brought me a little gift box of um, Paralympic apparel, um, photos, and just different things from Greece that, you know, try to include me into those games as well. And then in 2012, um, the, the best memory that I have was the, the first moment that we actually rolled onto the court and you, you realized that, wow, I'm here as a Paralympic athlete, I'm representing the United States of America. Um, and just to, to and capture all of that experience right there at that one instant when you pretty much roll on that court for the very first time. It, it's, it's overwhelming and then it's also just, um, it's a wonderful experience. And just to be in the village with all of the elite athletes and knowing that, you know, right after, um, right before the Paralympics, the Olympics takes place and you're in the same venue as they are and we're all one uh, Olympic family basically. So it was just that experience of being there, being on the court, that first breath of being in the, the basketball arena it was a, a wonderful experience. I think probably my favorite um, memories are, I have some from Seoul, but Barcelona, um, the opening ceremonies when we rolled into the stadium, it was such a, a, a really immense crowd cheering, screaming, people really excited to get the Paralympic Games started. So, and that was the first time that we'd had a sold out stadium for opening ceremonies in the Paralympic Games. And the Spanish um, people were just really warm and they were really knowledgeable about sports. So um, when we got out there to compete on the track as well, we had a similar experience. And um, during those games, the US women's wheelchair racing um, relay team, the four by 100 meter relay team, won the gold medal and set a world record. So that was really special too, to be able to, um, you know, to share that moment with my teammates of winning gold and reaching a world record. Um, I would have to say, uh, probably my favorite memory is really similar. 
um, the first time in 2009 on my first Stuff One Best when we walked into that stadium in Taiwan. It was just overwhelming to see all the people cheering and just being excited that we were there. That was truly incredible. And um, as far as with my team, I just think um, we have a really talented team and we've won um, every competition I've played in since I joined. And so we've had a lot of celebrations and I've really enjoyed those. Great. Thank you for sharing those experiences with us. Um, so on the flip side, what has been the biggest obstacle you have faced in training for or competing in the Paralympics or the Deaflympics? For training for wheelchair basketball, it was, it was, the funding was the, one of the most difficult or challenging obstacles, um, being able to afford to train, being able to afford your equipment for your wheelchair, uh, maybe having to purchase a new wheelchair, getting tires and tubes, uh, and then finding, the second one was finding space to train. Um, I went through several obstacles where, you know, I'm trying to call the local YMCA and uh, to see if I could get some court time. And the response is, well, we don't want your chair to ruin our floors. Um, we don't want your chair to mark up the floors. Um, or we don't, have the time in our schedule to allow one person to utilize our gym. And so that, that was really challenging to, just, to find time when no one else was in the gym, or maybe there was one or two people in the gym, gym and you have to share that space with those people. So that, that was very challenging. Um, train, training for 2012, it got to the point where I had to wake up at 4.30 in the morning just to get to the gym to beat the volleyball team, to beat the football team on rainy days well that you never did anyway if the football team took the gym they took the whole gym <laughs> um and then also to try and beat the uh the basketball teams into the gym and, and being able to utilize one court and for me i had a, i have a wonderful situation a wonderful facility where we have three basketball courts in uh the building where i work and so i could go there uh train go to the weight room and train and then go to work right in the same building. But the situation was that I had to wake up at 4.30 and get there at 5.30 to be able to train. Um, and, that, and that happened for, that took place for three years. And so that was, that was challenging. Um, it was very draining uh, to be able to do that for that long, uh, but it was worth it. It was all, it was worth the whole effort and the challenges completely. Great. And before you jump in, um, Andrea, could you maybe share what the average cost of your equipment was that you might have to save up for? Um, well, my chair cost, ooh, I think, I can't really remember the total, but I think my chair cost around $3,500. Um, the, the tires are $60. The tubes are about $20. Uh, I try to get grants that will that will pay for my chair. Uh, my local women's teams will give me discounted rate rates for tires. Uh, I had a sponsorship through Kenda Tires to get discounted rate for tires as well. But you're looking at, you know, I've, I've gone through six chairs in three, and I believe I had three of those chairs paid for through grants. And then the other three I paid out of pocket. Seems like those costs would add up quickly. Yes. Um, <laughs> all right, Anne, how about you? What, what has been your biggest challenge? Um, I, yeah, it's probably not too different than, <clears throat> than and what Andrea shared in terms of being able to finance, living, um, training full time, uh, going to competitions, paying your way there if necessary having the most um, technologically up-to-date sports equipment, particularly in wheelchair racing, and, um, and having a, a, you know, sponsors to help, uh, to help defray the costs of all of those things um, certainly was a big challenge. You know, we had to make decisions about, I mean, I worked full-time um, when I was training, and, or I was going to school full-time plus doing an assistantship plus training full time. So just really figuring out how to manage your time and resources because you didn't or as a person working full time um, while trying to train, you know, you're really 
we really are operating on very limited resources. Um, so that was always the challenge. I think the other thing that the other thing that was really difficult was the fact that nobody knew what the Paralympics were, and um, as mu as much as we all worked hard to educate everybody in our family and everybody who would listen to us, um, it just was it, it just could be really challenging to to you know to secure sponsors and and resources and even have the media write about um, the amazing opportunities that are available through. Uh, sport for people with disabilities. Great. We'll come back to maybe how some of those things have changed or not changed a little bit later on. Kate, how about you? Uh, I would probably have to say funding is another big thing for deaf Olympians. Um, USA Deaf Soccer, like I said, is a nonprofit organization. So each trip um, that I've been on, every player has had to raise between $5,000 and $6,000 to go. And as you can imagine, once you're going to three, four trips, it gets kind of awkward to ask the same people to contribute to your trip. So we've really been working on building a social media presence and just getting the awareness out there. And it's been pretty cool to watch and see the program grow. And what's actually interesting is in Recently, the U.S. Paralympic soccer team was brought under the U.S. Soccer Federation's umbrella, which is awesome. They're getting fully funded by U.S. soccer, and they don't have to pay their way to training. They don't have to pay their way to events. And so I hope that maybe that will open some doors for us down the road. Great. So you all talked about trying to balance or manage your schedules with training. Um, so what are some of the strategies that you relied on to uh, balance all of your responsibilities? Um, mostly it was just time management. Um, you really have to figure out, you know, how long is it going to take you to train um, different components, if it's weight training or if it's, you know, basketball training, uh, whatever that's going to be, and figuring out what that schedule is going to look like for your training and what time of day you're going to be able to get that in. And then uh, the work part, that wasn't too bad. Uh, most of our training camps occurred over the weekend, and we may have had a couple where I've missed uh, a couple of days of work. The, the most challenging component was the, the Paralympics, when you go for and you're away for three weeks at the beginning of the school year and you're still trying to get your students acquainted with their classes uh, at the same time you're supposed to be focused 100 percent on your competition so that was a little challenging but overall it wasn't that bad but the main thing is just is um, time management really knowing how to manipulate your ske your schedule uh, in order to fit every aspect in and for me my husband was involved in uh, adaptive sports as well so we both were able to compete on the same teams uh, through our local team. So that was our time together. Um, and so it worked out pretty well. It wasn't too challenging. It was just a matter of figuring out when your training schedule was gonna be and then everything else pretty much fell in place. I would say um, periodization was really important in, in wheelchair racing and really planning out your entire year um, and even having a three to five year plan if you were looking to, um, you know, make a Paralympic team. So, um, as Andrea mentioned, knowing what your training, um, you know, responsibilities were going to be in terms of doing the weight room training, the strengthening, conditioning, the flexibility training, as well as getting out on the track and the road and, and else. So, uh, so planning was really key, and that really helps manage. It helps you manage the rest of your responsibilities. Um, you also have to learn to say no and be really disciplined in order to be able to do, to do be at your best um, at the next competition or the next Paralympic Games. I think, as far as my experience balancing training and competing, um, I probably, as far as being a college athlete and being a high school athlete, I had access to facilities and 
for me, it was really just planning out my day and just figuring out what needs to be, what needs to get done and how I can do it. So I think now that I'm graduated and working, it will be a little different and I'll probably have to start um, organizing a little more because I won't have that easy access to my team facilities and the team equipment. So it'll be different, but I'm looking forward to it. Okay, great. So with the busy schedules, um, you can manage your time and you can plan it out. Um, but sometimes it might feel overwhelming. And I know that we're in, I think, week four of the semester for us here at, in Oshkosh. Um, so what are some ways that you take care of yourself or what forms of self-care do you engage in? Can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, like how did you... Like, if you needed a break or um, if you needed a time out from your schedule, like, what was your go-to to kind of recharge your batteries, so to say? Um, for me, it was the, the mental aspect of, you know, going through as a collegiate athlete uh, at a Division One college, you kind of learn how to escape certain scenarios or certain situations. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do with self-talk. Uh, one of mine is, you know, one of our, uh, our psychologists told us, our sports psychologists told us that, you know, when you get to a point, you, you need to make sure that you have a release word and you say that word to yourself to either lift you up or find something that's going to relax you, go into a room by yourself and just relax, clear your mind and things like that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm an animated person. I love cartoons and things like that. So, you know, I, I try to keep everything light. And so for me, when things got tense, um, my word was pink elephant. And it made me laugh. It made me, you know, pretty much just crack up. Really. And so that was, that was my release time in term to calm myself down and, and, and get composed. Well, when, I, when I knew that my body was tired, I took the time off. You have to be smart and know and listen to your body to realize that if you continue to go and go and continue to work out and train, eventually your body's going to break down. And I didn't want that to happen. Uh, since I was one of the oldest players on the team, I truly had to uh, make sure that I was taking care of my body so that I could still continue to compete at the same level as the girls who were literally 20 years younger than I was. Uh, so with the background in kinesiology, I kind of was uh, aware of how to listen to, your bod to my body um, and take that time off. Uh, nutrition was a big part of that training component. So being able to um, you know, eat healthy meals, uh, have a cheat day every now and then uh, just to maintain reality, true reality of, you know, being able to train for three years and that one year at, towards the Paralympic year, um, just being truly mentally focused on what your goal is. And your goal is to compete and your goal is to win gold. And so that's what I took through my entire training of those three years just to make sure that I pay attention to myself, I take care of my body, I take care of my mind so that I can continue to train and, and get through the Paralympics. Uh, let's see, what did I do to relax? Um, it was really helpful in that planning process to know when um, it was going to, when I'd be able to take breaks. Um, so we really tried to stick to that schedule if I needed time off. But really, uh, my coach was an exercise physiologist, and I loved learning about, um, you know, the physiology of training and everything. So I was always very curious about that, and that helped me kind of, um, you know, really pay attention to what was happening. If I was getting enough sleep, if I was, you know, on the verge of coming down with a cold or something like that, what could we do to adjust? Um, if I felt like I was getting some tendonitis or something um, cranking up in my shoulders, you know, do some activities to really reduce that. I really enjoyed the whole process of training and developing as an elite athlete. Um, but I loved, um, you know, going home. I was, I had trained and lived in Champaign, Illinois, and going home to upstate New York in the winter um, and being with family and being on the lake and things like that were always things to look forward to and to 
enable me to recharge. I also learned when I was actually when I was in the hospital recovering from my illness about um, Im imaging and relaxation techniques. And so um, I, I started using those in whatever situation I was in where I was feeling stressed or um, just needing to recharge using that technique. So similar to what Andrea was talking about in terms of the sports psychology. Uh, I think as far as um, finding that time away from whatever stressed me out is really important, like they were saying. Uh, for me, it was much more simple. I mean, I went to a school in the mountains. I would just go for a hike or something like that. Um, you know, I really trusted my athletic trainers and our nutritionists and the coaches to make sure that we were physically healthy and even mentally and I was really lucky to go to a school that really balanced both of those things in academics. Awesome. Well, I'm sure many of the students in this room have taken ex-phys, so I'm sure they like to hear that. And as someone who has a degree in sports psychology, I love how you all have used and relied on sports psychology. Um, so for those of us who may never be able to make it to the Paralympics or the Deaf Olympics, could you describe for us what daily life is like at the games and what is that environment like? Um, in 2012, the games were in London and, you know, at the village, you have all of the athletes from all of the countries living in this one village, which is pretty much a city itself. Um, we have a mayor of the village um, and we walk around as Joe's just like you're in your own town, it's your town. So it's really, it's really, um, I guess we're really fortunate to be able to walk around and speak to people from other countries, uh, get to learn about, you know, what they, how they train, uh, what they do in their countries as far as adapted sports or Paralympic sports are concerned. Um, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's actually really beautiful the way that they build the venue for all the athletes to participate. Um, we get to access different sports. Um, so we, even though I was participating in wheelchair basketball, I was able to go and see wheelchair tennis. Um, I wasn't, that was pretty much the only sport that I was able to see, but then we could also go outside of the village and, and visit London, the city of London as well. And so <clears throat> we were able to do that, but it, it's really a unique experience to just to be there as, one elite athlete out of all of the countries that participate and out of all the athletes who participate, you're one of them and you're competing with them, but at the same time, uh, you're, you're competing against them, I should say, but at the same time, you're competing with them because we're all there as adaptive athletes, Paralympic athletes, trying to bring awareness to other people, um, trying to recruit more Paralympians into our sports, uh, bringing it for the U.S., bringing more awareness in the U.S. so that we and and win more gold medals. So it's just a unique experience. It's one that uh, you truly never forget. Yeah, I, that experience is something that you want to take in, and it's also something that you have to manage in terms of your energy. <laughs> so you have to. Um, the best of, of the experience as well as make sure that you're focused on you know eating and um, so it feels like for each of the meals you're training you might be training once or twice a day um, or something related to your sport for me maybe it was doing some um, work on my chair my racing chair my gloves um, and just making sure that I wasn't expending too much energy, but um, really enjoying the village, all of the amenities that are there, and just being in that, in that environment where there are people with all kinds of disabilities from all over the world. And the really neat thing about Par the Paralympics is that each of us has a shared experience in terms of the um, marginalization or discrimination that we face because of our disability. Um, so that really brings, that really creates a, a bond that isn't necessarily going to be there in other, you know, sporting events. So that's a really tremendous experience and feeling 
as well. So I think um, as far as the Paralympics, it's a little bit different from the Deaf Olympics. The International Olympic Committee um, works with the Paralympics. And so um, that's why you see the Paralympics right after the Olympic Games. And the Deaf Olympics is actually kind of on a different schedule. So we had the Deaf Olympics in 2013, 2009, and our next one will be next year in Turkey. And so um, 2009 was by far the best Deaf Olympics I think that has ever been put on. They took a lot of money from the 2008 Beijing Olympics and they put it into that. So they built stadiums and venues for us. We didn't have an Olympic village. What generally happens is um, each country has a hotel that they kind of take over. So Team USA will have a hotel. Um, Team Great Britain will have a hotel. And it's kind of cool because you get to interact with all the US athletes. And then you go out to the city to see the other events. Um, actually, in 2013, Deaf Olympics, that was in Sofia, Bulgaria, but soccer events were outside of Sofia, so we were in a big resort with all the other soccer teams, so that was really interesting because I think a lot of people don't realize that sign language, as we know it, is American Sign Language, whereas other countries have sign language. So, for example, Great Britain has a different sign language than us. So it's super interesting to see people from other countries not only have different cultures, but they also have different deaf cultures and different sign languages. And somehow um, we find a way to communicate and it's very interesting. Awesome. So Anne and Andrea, could you describe some of the amenities that are provided for athletes in the Paralympic Village? Um, in London, they have, uh, they had different types of games that you can play. There's different areas where you can go to um, that are non-alcoholic bars uh, where you can go in and just hang out with, you know, the other athletes. Uh, the cafeteria is extremely large and they try to represent majority of the countries there for the food that they provide us. So they may have food from America, from um, Asia, Africa, just different places of the world that you get to try and so that people have, at least uh, their experiences are similar to the nutrition that they would eat at home. Um, and then, you know, you have, you have uh, the different venues, the different, um, the, 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 what you would, I guess you would call hotels or the buildings that we would stay in, those particular buildings have house our, um, our athletic trainer, trainers, um, our sports psychologists, uh, different people that we may need to see or access very easily without having to go outside of the village. One of the things that, um, that's really exciting about the village is that, um, well, International Paralympic Committee, um, who I serve on the governing board of has a, a partnership with Autobach, which is a durable medical equipment um, company. And so they produce, design and produce wheelchairs, um, prosthetics and orthotics. And they set up a whole repair center in the village. So any athlete from any country with any type of equipment can go there and get their chairs worked on it's from um, the emerging world uh, go there and they're encouraged and welcome to go there and get their equipment repaired and parts replaced and those sorts of things. Um, so that's a really amazing um, service that's provided in the village. There's also a poly clinic, which is like a, a medical um, center in the village for athletes to go, you know, if they need to be seen by a doctor. Um, you know, they provide those services there as well. Um, I'm trying to think in Rio if there's anything um, different and unique. There's a, um, during the Paralympic Games, the um, athletes who serve on the IPC Athletes Council are elected. So there's this whole area where all the athletes can go to learn more about the candidates who are running 
for the Athletes Council and they can learn more about um, the things that the International Paralympic Committee has and provides for athletes. Um, let's see, there's usually game, gaming facilities and um, you know, lounges and places for the athletes to hang out uh, and use technology. Um, in Barcelona, um, there, was a, there was a salon or, um, or barber shop and a post office, and there was a place where you could call home um, without having exorbitant, you know, long distance calls, which were an issue back, way back when I was an athlete. Um, and we could also go to a, an audiovisual room and see the um, see our events. So track and field athletes or basketball athletes could go and actually watch recordings of the events they'd already competed in, which was really neat. Awesome. I think the, the services to repair the equipment is something that a lot of people overlook, especially for the importance of that for Paralympic athletes. Um, so we've all touched about on this a little bit, but um, let's talk about how some of your social identities have impacted your experience. Um, so first, let's start with how has gender impacted your training or competition experiences? Um, for me, it, you know, it, for training purposes, like I said, you know, growing up, I was one of two females who participated in sports. Uh, so when I was training, there are, with wheelchair basketball, there's, there aren't that many females or women who participate in wheelchair basketball. Um, and so the area where I am in North Carolina, we don't have really any elite athletes or female athletes for wheelchair basketball in this area and on the east coast it's, it's very low the number is very low so i have spent my summer before uh, the paralympic games in 2012 in texas because texas has a very large uh, wheelchair basketball or adaptive sports program and so i'm able to go there and play with the collegiate program um, I can play with the, the Division II program, the Division III program, some of the junior kids, and my women's team as well. And so for that opportunity, um, again, I was one of two women who were playing with the men to, to get ready for the Paralympics. So typically on my end for wheelchair basketball, um, unless we were training with the U.S. Paralympic team, wheelchair basketball team, uh, you could probably say that I was one of two people who were playing on a men's team, uh, trying to train with the men's team to prepare myself for the Paralympics. So for me, um, this is an interesting, yeah, this, um, gaining access to facilities, um, being a priority sport or team um, or where you, you know, where we sort of fell in the priority <laughs> system at the university in terms of um, gym time, um, that was always challenging because while we were a varsity sport, we were not, you know, we weren't, um, we didn't have the same access that our men's and women's um, varsity basketball teams had. So we had to train at different, at, you know, less conducive times. We didn't have as much gym time um, as the other teams. And um, in competitions, I'll, I'll talk about wheelchair racing because um, the women who compete in wheelchair racing at the elite level are within, you know, very small percentage of the elite men in terms of their development and, um, and the times and... <laughs> and things that they achieve, but it's a lot smaller group of athletes from around the world who compete in the sport of wheelchair racing. So that's always a challenge because, um, you know, um, when you're going to races and things like that, if, if there aren't a lot of women competing in your event, if it's a track event in particular, then um, that event is likely to be removed from the, from the calendar, from the program. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest issues as a female athlete with a disability is that it just are, we're, I mean, 
we're just a, such a small percentage of that whole population that's eligible to participate and compete in Paralympic sport that are actually doing it. So we know that there are tremendous barriers for, for women and girls, um, not only in, in this country, but also around the world. I think just in general in the sports world, we see a, it everywhere that um, men kind of have better deals. Um, they're more prioritized. They have better uniforms, um, better practice times, better game times, even in nicer facilities. And I think, you know, it's changing and maybe you don't see that as much, but especially in other countries, um, you know, that's a problem. And I think that's something that women have been fighting a lot recently. Great. And are there any other identities um, beyond what we've discussed that you think have impacted your experience, such as race or sexuality? We've talked maybe a little bit about age, but can expand if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, um, I think these intersections are really important to understand and, and that, that they probably exist. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm struggling right now to, to draw on a personal experience. Um, when I work in my work at the State Department and in the International Paralympic Committee, really some of the challenges that we have are around um, women and uh, women from who are, who's, who are religiously Muslims, um, them being able to compete in sport and also, you know, meet the requirements of their religious. Um, so sometimes uniform rules around uniforms and what athletes should and shouldn't wear, can and can't wear, in the in the competition arena, um, are things that that we've had to deal with and address to make sure that we aren't. Uh, women who um, who have those religious requirements from participating and competing in sport. Um, I would say, you know, looking at, I would say wheelchair basketball specifically. Um, like I stated earlier, we're we're small in number, especially for females. <clears throat> um, and if you look at the intercollegiate programs. We only have four women's intercollegiate wheelchair basketball programs. Um, and I believe, I'm not sure of the number, so I'm not going to give you a number, but um, if you look at where your girls live compared to where there's a team located, um, you have to look at the barriers that get into the way with traveling to a practice. Um, once you're on that team, if you're a female, you're probably going to be one of probably less than five females on a junior's team. Um, and then to be able to earn playing time on that team becomes limited. And so, again, you're looking, you look at the gender component there of, you know, why do we have such low numbers of girls and women participating in wheelchair basketball specifically and in adaptive sports as well. Um, so, so that becomes a problem. And, and in order to change that problem, we have to create more opportunities for girls, uh, women, and people with disabilities uh, in general to be able to participate in physical activity and, and adapted sport. And so when you look at you know, where these teams exist and where they're located within the United States and you look at the distances that people have to travel and then they have to be able to have transportation in order to travel to uh, those areas. That's when you start to get into the socioeconomical uh, areas. Um, you know, so you, if you look at the diversity of adapted sports, you're not going to see a lot of diversity in certain sports because of the opportunities are limited in those areas. Um, and the funding is limited. So we have, a, in the U.S. alone, we do have different types of barriers um, for girls, women, and uh, individuals with disabilities, just like other countries do. 
probably just not as impacted as other countries. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add there. My own personal experience. Okay. Yeah, and I think nationality is something that is really brought out when we talk about the Paralympic Games and the Deaf Olympic Games because we're bringing people together from countries all around the world. Um, so that's another thing to think about as well. Um, let's take a few questions from the audience, if anybody has some. If you could pick any other sport, what would you pick? Uh, one of two. I would either do wheelchair tennis or swimming. I grew up as a swimmer from a very young age. I was a competitive swimmer, so and I loved to swim, and I was pretty decent at swimming, so probably swimming would be my primary sport. Um, I would say hand cycling. So the, um, the time trial, the road race, the time trial, all those things um, on a hand cycle. And then maybe archery <laughs> would be my second choice. I think probably basketball. I grew up playing basketball, but I'm kind of short, so I don't know how that would work out. I know that Andrea is used to this <laughs> with her students, maybe. <laughs> okay, while well, they continue to think, because we're going to come back to them, um, what is the biggest change you have seen in adapted or disability sport in your lifetime? I would have to say the, the visibility. Um, you know, when I, when I first started, actually, I'll, I'll go back to when I was a graduate student. It's kind of ironic. When my final paper for my uh, master's degree was on wheelchair basketball, and I had no idea that wheelchair basketball existed. I, I don't even know why I chose that topic to write that paper on. And then when I went to work on my doctorate, um, I got into wheelchair basketball, not even realizing that I just wrote a paper on it. And so, you know, since I've been involved in adaptive sports, um, you know, you go from the Paralympic side of it and you don't see anything about the Paralympics. People don't know that the Paralympics exist. They don't know what it is. They don't know the difference between the Paralympics and the Special Olympics. Um, and then you start to, to see, you know, a little bit more people with disabilities on uh, television and commercials um, and movies and, and shows, television shows. Uh, then you start to see, you know, adapted sports commercials. Uh, you start to see stores that are utilizing children who are in wheelchairs uh, participating in sport. So I, I would have to say, you know, the opportunities have grown uh, and the awareness has grown, um, but more so the visibility is, is really starting to grow. And I, I would say right along with that, um, society at large in the, in the United States has also benefited the visibility of um, Special Olympics, Paralympics, and Deaf Olympics, but also um, because the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was enacted in 1990, um, a lot, everything is more accessible. So you have these accessibility features and in, in when you travel and where you work and where you live so and you also see more people with disabilities and for me when I was first disabled um, people when I would go out in public people would stare um, they would ask me really invasive inappropriate questions um, they would try to heal me um, they, they um, 
a date so I wouldn't feel bad. <laughs> um, lots of interesting you know, stuff socially and, and publicly um, that was really frustrating, you know. But anyway, and, and you don't really see that in this country anymore. You, people are so used to seeing those of us with disabilities that they don't stare. And they're much more aware of, um, you know, how to interact with us as human beings, as individuals, um, on, an, on a more equal basis. And so um, it's been really exciting to see that whole transformation at the, same t at the same time that we've seen the evolution of sport and the visibility of sport and people with disabilities, you know, participating and competing in sport. Yeah, I think um, just seeing the awareness for the Paralympics, especially, that's been really cool to see. And I think the Deaf Olympics is, you know, not quite there yet, but hopefully in the next few years. But as far as personally, what I've found interesting is um, there's been a shift kind of. Um, if you look at the capital D Deaf culture, that's um, people who sign and don't wear hearing devices. There's been kind of a shift to I would say more of the hard of hearing, people with hearing devices, people like me, people who don't sign. And it's cool to see the blend of all of that. And that's kind of what makes the team so unique. Um, not that there's anything wrong with signing. I think it's really awesome. Um, very, very interesting culture as far as the capital D deaf culture. Uh, and I think a lot of that's because of, especially in Western countries, there's more access to that technology now, and you see insurance companies are starting to cover it. So it's very interesting to kind of see how it's shifted, even in the six, seven years that I've been part of the Deaf Olympics. Great. And if you could pick one thing to change about the Paralympics or the Deaf Olympics, what would it be? I would probably say the the equity between the Paralympics and the Olympics, uh, so that there there's more of a balance between the two, um, and, and probably you know the equity with funding. That would be that would be the wish that I would like to see is for there to be an equal balance with funding and financial components for the Paralympics, Deaf Olympics, and the Olympics. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking of the equity situation as well, but thinking of it and agree with Andrea, but also thinking about it across the world, um, because so many people with disabilities don't have access to the types of equipment that we have here in the U.S., even though we have to raise money for it and, or, or find, out, find a way to pay for it ourselves. Um, it's not, you know, the cost is prohibitive for people in many countries to do that. So I'd just like to see more equity, I guess, across <laughs> across the world and not such a disparity in terms of poverty and um, discrimination and all of that. Yeah, I would kind of have to agree with the equity and um, the funding. I think as far as the Deaf Olympics goes, um, we're kind of in a tough spot. Um, the Deaf Olympics was originally supposed to be part of the Paralympics. Um, it was supposed to be after the Olympics in a way, I think, as far as I understood. And um, the, Deaf the Deaf Olympians kind of pulled away from that just because they're such a proud culture. And I would really love to see the um, ICSD, which is the International Committee of Sports for the Deaf. I would really like them to see, I would really like to see them get involved with the um, International Olympic Committee again. That would be very cool to see. Um, I've heard some talk of some Deaf Olympians or some Deaf Olympic sports being involved in Tokyo in 2020. So that would be really exciting. Okay, have any questions popped up from the audience? So in the US, um, during the Olympic Games this year, we saw a lot of media about um, concerns with the Paralympics and funding and ticket sales being down and the potential for um, events to possibly be canceled. Um, do you hold out more hope for 2020 that that um, potentially will change? Can you repeat that? I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Yeah, so it's related to the concern. Um, there were several media articles that were saying essentially that Rio was going to 
run out of money before the Paralympics were held. Um, so the question was, is there more hope for 2020 that there will be more stability um, and reassurance for the Paralympic Games to run smoothly? Um, I can take that one if you want. Uh, yeah, um, the, when a city um, bids to host the Olympic and Paralympic Games, um, they're required to put forth um, a proposal for how they would do that. And then there are very specific criteria that the International Olympic Committee um, um, requires these bidding committees to, to meet and to commit to. And when the actual city and country are selected, an agreement that includes the requirements for, um, for the Olympic Games. And there's, there's very specific information about how they would do that. So. Uh, for an, an organizing committee to say that they're not going to be able to meet, you know, to, to have enough funding, critical funding areas, like service areas for athletes and sports, is really a breach of contract. And it's something that would, um, throughout the sports world um, for, for decades, really. So um, sometimes we get caught, as we saw in Rio, in sort of um um, a bit of a shell game in terms of um, funding. The um, Rio organizing committee was kind of um, the, the state and local government and federal government of, of Brazil were wanting to extract information about the or organizing committee budget and so they actually put a barrier in place that prevented the funds for, for the Paralympics from being released to the organizing committee. So it was, um, you know, interesting how the politics really entered into that. Um, I think um, both the International Olympic Committee and International Paralympic Committee certainly want to ensure that um, we don't find ourselves in that situation again. Um, the um, Tokyo 2020 organizing committee is very committed to the games, as was Rio, and they've um, they entered into contracts and agreements to provide the level of service that you would expect at the Paralympic Games and at the Olympic Games. Um, you know, we just work with the organizing committee very closely to ensure that they're meeting all the milestones that they need to meet in terms of is securing sponsors that'll help, you know, pay for the games. Um, and so forth. So there are lots of, um, you know, structures in place to make sure that that happens. And the situation that we found ourselves in Rio is pretty unique. Yeah, and hopefully uh, the games will come back to the U.S. in 2024 if L.A. gets the bid. Right, then it'll be our turn to meet all those requirements. <laughs> right. Yeah, and so if people don't know about the bidding process, um, it starts almost a decade ahead of the game. So it is quite an extensive process um, for people to go through the bid. Um, okay, so any other questions from the audience? I want to know um, how, how many of the people in the audience got to see the, any of the competitions from the Rio Paralympic Games? Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, was it mostly online or on the cable NBC network? So they're raising their hand for online. Okay. And what about on TV? Okay. Great. great. That's really progress. It's, I'm excited and, and um, hopeful. <laughs> Just um, seeing how many more people were able to access the coverage of the games because we still have quite a bit of challenges with that, um, with our NBC broadcasting partners. In Rio, they actually provided more coverage than ever before, uh, than they've ever done before. So um, we want to encourage them to continue to do that and really grow and develop the Paralympic brand um, and coverage of the Games. I also just wanted to say that the Rio Paralympic Games were a, a tremendous success. Despite those political um, trappings we found ourselves in, um, 
the games were fantastic. The athletes were very well served and supported. And um, in the end, it turned out to be a great game. Yeah, I think I saw an article that there were a record number of tickets sold to the games. So it's great to see these records be broken and hopefully we can keep breaking the records. Um, okay, any other questions pop up? Okay, you all are lucky I prepared. Actually, these are the questions from the students, so you, you all got the out. Um, okay, so what do you want to see for the future of adaptive or disability sport? I would like to see, um, you know, for, for the challenges or um, areas to not have to put together an adaptive sport opportunity for someone. It's always there. It's always available for uh, children, for adults to participate in. Uh, you don't have to search uh, for those opportunities outside of your area or you don't have to travel outside of your state to, to participate in these particular opportunities. So I would like to see continued growth um, with more opportunities for individuals with disabilities to participate in adaptive sport. And then the, gr the growth is, is changing with the different types of adaptive sports that are becoming available, such as wheelchair lacrosse. Uh, that's another a new sport that's taking place. Um, adaptive CrossFit is another one that's starting. So that particular growth um, and getting more people involved in the physical activity component without having to, like I said, to leave their state or to travel two or three hours to be able to participate in the opportunity, and then having the accessibility and accommodations to be able to get to those opportunities to participate in activity. That's perfect. I can't say it better. <laughs> yeah, I think that's perfect too. Okay, so you have told us what you envision for the future, but what can those of us that are in this room, what can we do to help that future be realized? I'll let someone else take this. We really need, um, we really need trained and educated um, folks working in the community. So as coaches, as administrators, um, as physical education teachers to professors, um, we just need to make sure that everybody, you know, has the information they need to know how to fully include um, people with disabilities in their um, programs and facilities, um, as Andrea mentioned, so that it's not something that has to be, you know, put together or really, um, or the person with the disability has to search for it. It's there. So you're, you have the knowledge embedded in wherever, wherever you work and whatever you do. Um, yeah, it's important for you to be a resource and to help educate um, people with disabilities who you come in contact with about the options that they have in sports and being physically active and how important it is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that, that you all are um, really important to helping us get to that um, goal of full inclusion. Yeah, but I, I always tell my students when they, when they exit my adaptive physical education course, they're now advocates. So anytime that you learn about adaptive sports, uh, Paralympics, Deaf Olympics, you have become an advocate for us. Um, you are now another resource to spread awareness about uh, the opportunities that need to exist or that do exist. Uh, so it, it, it becomes, it come, becomes on to, it turns to your, to your shoulders uh, to bear that weight to, to make opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially as you guys, you know, graduate and you start off in the business world, maybe um, when you're a boss, when you're in charge of people and you have someone who maybe is a deaf employee, making sure that they have access to an interpreter is really important. And I think just realizing that 
Um, you know, in sports, uh, it's a different game. It's not necessarily comparable to um, what we would say normal sports. So just as a fan base, almost just realizing that I think will be extremely important. Great. And has have anybody has anybody um, come up with a question? Last chance. All right. So one last question. Um, what's next for you? So for me, um, I want to get more, I guess, become more involved with uh, helping young people <clears throat> um, build their skills, young people with disabilities, build their skills to become successful in life uh, and to provide opportunities for my students to be involved in uh, adapted sport or adapted physical activity, either one, uh, just so that they are having the opportunities to to grow and to learn and expand their knowledge base so that they're not focused just on individuals without disabilities but everyone so that everyone is included and they have the skills that in order to include everyone in whatever setting that they go into um for let's see what's next um well, I'll continue to um, serve on the IPC governing board for um, the final year of my term, my final term, and um, continue to work through uh, my role at the State Department to um, increase access and opportunities for people with disabilities to participate in sports um, more globally. Um, Yeah, so I just graduated, so kind of just figuring my way out in the real world and hopefully staying involved with um, the deaf team and uh, just helping grow that awareness and the deaf form fix and USA deaf soccer. Okay, great. And I know that your name was thrown up for vice president of the International Paralympic Committee at one point. Any future plans with that? Um, to be determined. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So if everyone could thank our panelists. They're all in Eastern time, so they are, it's 930 for them. Um, so we will let them go and get prepared. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we really enjoyed hearing about your experiences. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.